あるとマイクみたいになりたいでも電話してくれないオークランドとウックレンドから世界チャンピオンバーチャルプローズ始まるよりよりよりよりよりよりよりよりよりバーチャルプローズオブローチャンピオンバーチャルプローズポッドキャスト。My name is Al, aka Guaki My Via, aka Jun Guaki Yama, aka Bima Nobunaga, aka Trillberg, aka Katsuyori Shibrata, and with me, my East Coast Oos, Mike. Hey, it's Mike, aka Pusha Kimura, aka Tiger Mask 420, aka Dr. Death Steve Williams. <laughs> Today's episode, a really big one, the 2016 Super S Cup. Who will win this year's most shameful wrestling fan base? Hit us on iTunes and subscribe if you haven't already.、Uh, hit us on SoundCloud, just search for Virtual Pros. If you don't follow us on Twitter, you can find us at VRTL Pros. Same as our Instagram.、Uh, please follow us on both. And if you want to email us, please do so at virtualpros64 at gmail.com. Uh, Mike, we got, we got two emails in. Do you mind reading those by any chance? Yeah, sure. Is the first one from George? Is that the email you're talking about? Yeah, the first one's from George. Okay. Okay. So George sent us a Jerry Lawler versus Leatherface video that I haven't watched yet. Me neither. I think, I think this is the first time I'm actually seeing this, this email. So I'm sorry, George, but I will watch it because、uh, I love Leatherface. So it's probably great. He also says, What's up with the Larry Zabisco hate on the new episode? Don't you know he's the leisure suit Larry of pro wrestling? Keep up the great work, George, aka Fiend Ambrose, aka Thumpin' Jim Brunzel, aka Loco Beware. Um, I was never really a fan of Larry Z anyway, but I mean, to have an 8x10 in your household is kind of really weird to me. Like, how do you feel about that? Yeah, yeah. I, I think, again, I'm more I'm into curious items like、uh, kiss cards. So, yep. And、uh, my Super Delphin clock. So, I think it would be funny to have a Larry Zabisco autograph. Not a huge fan. I did like when he wrestled, he did the stall move a lot. I always like when wrestlers stall because that is like the most douchey thing you could do in wrestling, I believe. So, so I like that. But、uh, yeah, I, I, I don't hate him as much as、uh, Al does. But. Hey, is that clock operational by any chance? The Super Delphin clock that you copped off at Toticon? Yes, but it's so loud. So I can't, <laughs> I can't keep the battery in because it's like. I had to take it out like after I got it, like the first time we recorded, I had to take the battery out because it's so fucking loud. It's probably louder than my fan. So, like the clicking noise, the TikTok yeah, noise? Yeah, the, the clicking noise is so loud. It's、Damn、ridiculous.、Shit. Yeah. Damn, Super Delphin, step it、That's、up. probably why it was like 10 bucks, but there you go. Yeah. Okay,、uh, the next one. Hold on a second. I just X'd out. Oh, there, there we go. This is from、uh, DC, aka Kid Cash from ECW.、Um, this is just says questions. Help me understand something. I thought Mike thought ja- watching Japanese women's wrestling was creepy. Since episode one to now, his opinion on this has changed. What the hell happened? He's the biggest <laughs> fan now. I don't know if I'm the biggest fan now. But I will say, we'll, we'll probably get more into this later in the,、uh, the shame tournament but, and, uh, and in the,、uh, the mixtape for this week. But, but I guess to sum it up, I think Al has shown me the light that you can. Watch women's wrestling and not be、uh, the stereotypical women's wrestling viewer. Like,、uh, I still think it's, I still think the average women's wrestling fan is a creep because they are, they're repressing themselves basically, where they're, they're like, don't want to say they're watching it because the girls give them boners and they just want to say it's because they're great athletes. And、uh, I can admit that these girls give me boners. So, fine watching it. Plus, I like stardom because. I, honestly, like 75% of the reason I think the Stardom channel is so good is because of the subtitles. And that just like ties everything together. It makes it amazing. And it's so bizarre and weird to me. 
Because, like, like, I would say, like, more than half of the matches are kind of garbage. So it's not really for the wrestling, that's for sure. Oh, don't get me wrong, man. Like, there's a reason why they have a one-camera, low-angle viewpoint when they shoot those matches. And you know what? Yeah. I enjoy it. I'm a fucking man. I like that kind of yeah. thing. I don't um, want to... I don't want to blow my load. Like I said, I'm going to get way more into this when it comes to the uh, the tournament section of this episode. So, Hey, man, the female body. It's beautiful. We can all enjoy yes. it. Uh, we'll go to two-man scramble now, and I have two topics. Uh, Mike, you recently got hooked up with some tickets to the recent uh, Ring of Honor New Japan War of the World show. I think that's what it was <laughs> called. Um, something like that. No. Something like yeah. that, right? Uh, yeah. Can you just please share your stories from this event? Well, yeah, I only had two topics this week, too, and basically one was just leading into the ROH So Anyway, so if you had another topic... We can just lead into that right now. It's all good. Okay, so... um, What fucks everything up? Uh, Basically, (laughs) okay, first I have to ask you a question, and then I'll lead into my ROH story. Cool. But uh so i got hooked up with these tickets i made a new friend over the past few weeks listener brian it's a dude who i met through uh my friend dave who sometimes listens to the show and he's like oh i have this friend brian he goes to wrestling and shit you guys should hang out and so we went to evolve a few weeks ago and uh you know that was like my first time meeting him and he's like you know he we had like a mutual friend and i don't think my friend dave would hang out with weirdos so i was like okay he's probably cool so you know we hung out and then we went to roh so my first topic would be, Al, what would you do if you were put into the situation where someone were like, oh, yeah, my friend goes to wrestling. You should go with them. So you're meeting this guy for the first time and then you show up and you go to like whatever you're going to hood slam or whatever. And uh, you sit down and he just starts chanting like this is wrestling and like both <laughs> these guys. And he's like telling you who Paul should hire next. Like, what what would you do? Because I was thinking about that, like, after I came home from Evolve. I was like, what if Brian was, like, a real weirdo? That would have sucked. Oh, I have no issues. So, uh, <laughs> the context would be that we have a mutual friend, right? Yeah. I would probably be really polite and, like, stay the entire time. <laughs> but there would be a lot of, like, texts to you and to our mutual <laughs> friend about how mad I was at this event. <laughs> Um, but I have, you know, considerations, uh, but I would definitely talk some shit behind that person's back for sure. And, uh, never be in that situation again. Um, going on a wrestling blind date is kind of weird, but I mean, it works out, man. I mean, it yeah. sounded like it worked out. So, I mean, props to you. Yeah. Um, so yeah, we went to ROH last week or I guess last Saturday or well, two weeks ago now when you're listening to this probably. And, uh, yeah, it was. I don't I don't think it was a pay-per-view. I think they just put it on demand or something. I yeah, mean, know yeah. there was cameras there, but uh I mean overall before I get into it, it was probably like one of the funnest wrestling shows I've ever been to. And if you guys don't know, it was the New Japan tour, so it was a bunch of New Japan wrestlers. I'm not very familiar with ROH wrestlers uh outside of that, outside of like New Japan dealings. And uh so yeah, Brian was like, "Yeah, my friend works for ROH. He could hook us up." And I was kind of skeptical because, you know, people say their friends work for a lot of shit and doesn't ter- to- doesn't uh, pan out. But uh, it did pan out. His friend does work for ROH and uh, he got us in. And first he just got us in and like we were just like in the bar area. And I was like, this is pretty fucking sweet. Uh, it was at Terminal 5. If you are a New York listener and you're listening to this, Terminal 5 isn't really the best venue. It's like three tiers. There's like three floors. So there's two balcony sections. And then the floor section. And if you don't have like floor seats, you're just kind of like got to kind of hope for the best, basically. And uh, and then the dude was like, oh, yeah, I can seat you over here. And he just like got some seats and sat us like right against like the wrestlers entrance where they come in. So we were just like as soon as like the wrestlers come out of the little curtain they have, like we were right there. And uh, so that was pretty sweet. And because I've never like sat that close to like an actual like wrestler entrance before. Yep. And uh, so. We sit down, we watch like whatever the match was, whatever the first match was, was some four way match. I don't know what the fuck it was. But um there was this guy who was like trying to take pictures and a grown adult, a grown man, probably even older than I, was like sitting sort of near us and I, I must admit he probably paid for his seats, so like I understand his his plight. But um you could tell he was kinda agitated that we took like his secret wrestling photo and video spot. <laughs> and uh like as soon as like the match ended, he said something like, "Oh, you guys got you guys know somebody, right? You got you got hooked up." And we just like looked at him like, "Okay, whatever, <laughs> dude." Like, 
that's like a very rude thing to ask, but you know, whatever. And, uh, so throughout like the rest of the show, he was like literally reaching over us to take videos, like to the point where like, if we had paid for that, like it would have been a fight, but like, it's just like, we can't really say anything that badly. Cause like, you know, I don't want to get, I don't know, like my friend's friend, and yeah. I don't want to get him in trouble or anything like that. But it was just like, it was like real sad, like how bad this guy needed to take these videos of these entrances for God knows what. I don't know if he has a podcast himself or yeah. a YouTube show, but it was fucking super sad. But, you know, like in deep down, I'm just like, this is probably all this guy has. Like, I'm probably just going to go do something fun, like something different fun next weekend. So, like, it's not really a big deal to me. He was so, not on a wrestling blind date, it sounds like. He was there no, alone. Okay. No. He was he was definitely there on a mission to take videos of these wrestlers. And he was probably thinking about it for months, and we fucked him up. <laughs> so, I understand. But, uh, yeah, so all the wrestling was cool. You, like, all those New Japan wrestlers, like, they're they're so good. Even when they're just, like... I'm not going to say half-assing it, but, you know, they're not they're not on 10. They're probably more on 7 yeah. for the uh, the ROH shows. But they're all great. I acted like a fucking, as the uh, as the real insider podcasters would say, would say I acted like a mark because I high-fived Jushin Liger. Shit. I've, I've never, like, touched a wrestler or anything because I think that's weird, but I high-fived Jushin Liger. I fist-bumped Naido. Oh, I, uh, man. That's it. I didn't too sweet anybody. I didn't go that far, but, but um, all the matches were pretty good. Uh, afterwards, this is where the story gets good. Uh, like we were like filing out and I don't know, like, I think I just, we, we just hit like the sweet spot where we were like trying to leave when Tanahashi was like setting up a little makeshift, like merch autograph booth. Yeah. And he was like signing some dorks belt and Wait, just, which like, belt did he have Tanahashi sign? Do you know? I don't know. It had like a red leather strap. I don't know. I think it might've been an ROH belt. I have no idea. Was it was it the Stardom belt, the Io Shirai belt? Because that had been <laughs> fucking amazing. That was the belt he had himself. Oh my god, I would ask him to take a picture with that belt if that was it. But no, it was like it was some red belt. I assume it's an ROH belt, but I don't know. He had like a ton of autographs on the back. That's all I saw. But and me being naive, like I'm just like, oh, like he's probably just taking pictures with people. So I'm like, yo, Tanahashi, can I get a picture? And he's like, yeah. And I like give my friend the camera and he's like ten dollars and I'm like, huh? And he's like, ten dollars. And I'm just like <laughs> Oh, okay, like that's I guess that's fucking reasonable to yeah. take a picture with another human being. So like he has a handler. Him and Kushida had a handler and like uh so I give the handler like a twenty dollar bill and the motherfucker's like, I don't have any change and I'm just like, uh and he's just like, Why don't you just oh the whole scam, it was kind of like probably how like <laughs> prostitutes work. Where, like, you're really paying to get the picture with Tanahashi, but he's giving, like, little... Speaking of which, you still haven't gotten the Tanahashi autograph in the mail, have you? I'm really sad about it, dude. Like, okay, let's talk about it now. Like, how did you mail this? Is it in, like, an envelope? Like, a manila envelope? Is it's it in a, a box? manila envelope. Okay. I have, I have a side business. I mail out fucking... Not hundreds, but I mail out a lot of these envelopes. And, like, never had a problem. So, I don't know. Hopefully it shows up. But anyways... To go on. So he's selling like these little autographs that he's autographing right there. They're just like random pictures. He has t- tons of them. Yeah. So the handler is like, oh, I can just give you two. And then I'm like, okay. Cause I'm just like, you know, I can't be like, no, man, give me my money back. Cause that's like <laughs> fucking super rude. So I just, he just put me in like this corner oh, where I knew. know, yeah, where I had like no, like there's no way out. Like I had to be like, yeah, sure. I'll take two of these autographs that I don't want. I just want one picture that I thought was free. So I got a picture of Tanahashi. And then Ishii set up too, and I was like, "Oh, I'd rather have a picture with him, anyways." And he was charging twenty dollars, so I was like, "Fuck him!" Like, <laughs> wait, uh, just for like an eight by ten of himself, or like just the, I, for the opportunity to take a picture with him? Eight by ten autograph and the opportunity to take a picture with him, and it was uh, just like, "Come yeah. on, dude!" Like, <laughs> like Tanahashi and Kushida are charging ten bucks. Like, come on. But so I got my my stupid autographs with Tanahashi, one of which is amazing. This is the one I sent to you. So I hope it shows up. Me too, man. I'm really bummed that it hasn't showed up yet. And, uh, you know, we're like, whatever. And uh, then we had to meet my friend's friend in the back of the venue, like outside of the venue to like go, you know, talk or whatever. And uh, as we're going back there, like the wrestlers are walking out. And uh, one of the wrestlers was Tanahashi. 
And he walks out and he says to my friend Brian, yo, nice sneakers. He actually said yo, which is weird because I didn't imagine Tanahashi talking like that. And it was because they are wearing the same sneakers. So if you guys wanted to know, Tanahashi is a sneakerhead. My friend Brian works at a, a sneaker boutique, so he has all the hottest sneakers. So they're wearing the, the they're both wearing white on white Adidas boosts, I think they're called. Yep. And uh, yeah, so that was a moment where I was like, whoa, he is wearing the same sneakers. That's crazy. At the same time, a little after that, um, the the evil Usos came out. The uh, gorillas, the gorillas of Dust of Destiny came out. And uh, these two dudes, two again, I'm not going to say grown adults. They were adults. They were definitely old, like definitely in their 20s. They're like, yo, can we get a picture, blah, blah, blah. And like they took a picture with him. And then uh, they, you know, the gorillas left on their merry way. And the two dudes I got a picture started jumping up and down, holding each other because they were so happy they got a picture with these dudes. And that was one of the saddest things I've ever seen because I don't, I, I don't, I can't think of anybody, especially a wrestler, that I would ever be that happy to get a picture with. But they fucking loved it. So good for them. Good for them for having, uh, being more into their hobbies than me. But yeah, overall, it was a great time. It was just, uh, it was just, yeah, it was, it was wrestling and, uh, it was real fun. Yeah, two things. Uh, your story about getting hustled by Tanahashi beats mine about getting hustled by Super <laughs> Delphin. Uh, that's really amazing. Seeing as he was charging $10 and didn't have change for $10. Yeah, um, dude. I'm like, <laughs> it's like, I try and give him the benefit of the doubt because like I said, he was, he was just setting up as we were like walking yeah. by, which was odd because we were kind of like straggling behind as it was. So like he was missing the rush. So I don't know why he was just setting up, but. Because, like, after we got our pictures, like, there was kind of a big line. But still, I was like, dude, come on. Like, $10? <laughs> you, like, get it from Kushida. He's right there. Like, I'm sure he has $10. And it's just, I don't know, whatever. And uh, number two, if uh, Tanahashi tagged uh, OOTD, Outfit of the Day, on his Instagram, <laughs> he would probably be more famous for his outfit photos than he would be for his professional wrestling. Because that guy... <laughs> <laughs> has some crazy ensembles and he's a pretty well-dressed man i won't even fucking front so uh yeah tanahashi shout out to you for being a scumbag but a good dresser yeah. oh also what i also sent alan when i got myself i got a whole stack of okada bucks yeah so. you're supposed to throw those but you didn't because you're smart i threw a few but yeah i kept a bunch no nah, you did the right move um those are your two topics for two-man scramble yes that, those were that was it okay I, so, uh Past couple of days, or like a couple of days ago, um, there was an argument about whether or not like Sasha Banks and Bailey should get the credit uh, they deserve from their Brooklyn NXT match because it was rehearsed. Do you care if a match is rehearsed? Like, do you take points away like if they practice their match before they actually perform it? I think this gets into the part of wrestling that I don't enjoy, which is um, when people use wrestling terms and stuff like that because it's like again. As I've said on multiple episodes, when you use wrestling terms, it's just like you're using the terms of somebody whose job it is to use those terms. So it's like, you know, if you started using the terms that McDonald's uses for their their work. And uh, I think that's the same thing. I don't really care if they rehearse anything because I, you know, I would assume everybody rehearsed it. Like right. <laughs> I don't fucking know. Yeah, exactly. Like I know, you know, like there's still some mystery to me when it comes to wrestling. Like when white people... Or even Spanish people go wrestle in Japan and vice versa. I'm just like, how do they do this? Like, they don't speak the same language. This must be real difficult. And I don't know. I don't care to know either. I don't want that ruined for me. I just think it's pretty amazing that they could have, like, great matches and not speak the same language. So, yeah, I just think that's nitpicking. I think, uh, obviously, women get a, a harder, like, people are more harder on them. And uh, it's because they're women. And that's, you know, it's just how the world is. Speaking of which, I'm going to put them on blast. Uh, I listen to a bunch of different shitty podcasts, shitty wrestling podcasts. Oh, you were firing shots on Twitter in the past week. That was all Mike, <laughs> by the way, guys. I'm about peace. Yeah. Oh, this guy, Mike, man, he's yeah. out of control. Deep down, I am like sort of a positive person where I it is my goal to find another like-minded wrestling podcast because I know what we do is kind of unique for the wrestling world, but I don't want to think it's so unique that we're the only people that do this, but... I mean, at this point, man, I've listened to a lot of podcasts and I have heard nothing like this, nothing that even comes close to what we're doing. So it sucks because I would really like to find one and be like, hey, we should be friends. And that's how you build like a bigger listener base and stuff like that. But I just can't find anything. But I listened to this one podcast called Wrestling Soup, which I assume has more followers than us because they have like thousands of episodes. And I think they do like live shows and shit like that. But uh, 
I clicked on it because I was like, oh, they have like a decent logo. So they're probably not just like little kids with a room mic or anything like that. And uh, they suck. They're like meatballs, like total fucking Guido assholes. And uh, one of like the first thing they start off with is like, oh, man, Paige is dating Alberto Del Rio. She's a slut. (laughs) And it's just like, dude, how fucking old are you where you talk about women like that? Like, no wonder you're a host of a wrestling podcast and that's probably the greatest achievement of your life because you treat women that way and i don't know so i you know it's probably really outside of stuff like stardom where they i think they go into it knowing hey this is what we do we do this crazy hard wrestling and people want to look at our butts outside of that like i think for wwe wrestlers and american women wrestlers it's probably kind of a pain in the ass to deal with that shit a lot so good for them rehearse your matches all you want bailey and sasha banks yeah, I mean, like, it's kind of like in hip hop where a lot of people give supernatural credit that he can do all these crazy things off the top of his head. And that's remarkable, but he can't make a great song. I'd yeah, rather have write someone, a good song. Yeah, write a great song. <laughs> Rehearse that. I'm more impressed with that than you being able to rhyme a bottle opener off the top of your head with something else. Yes, it's, yeah, I've never understood that. Like, that's cool that you could do this one skill. You know who else rehearsed their match? Macho Man, Randy Savage, and Ricky Steamboat. Give them shit. Yeah, I mean, Macho Man made like Steamboat take like copious amounts of notes and made him memorize that entire thing. And uh, uh, also, that's uh, one of Cameron's favorite matches. Uh, I heard that on the Stone Cold Steve Austin podcast now, which is pretty funny. <laughs> um, other than that, uh, with regards to the podcasters, Wei Ting, I still want to be your friend, man. Like, if you're listening, I hope you are. Oh, yeah, I Let's will be buzzed, say, dude. I will say the only podcasts I like are the the law podcasts, but they're not podcasts because it's like a professional radio show they get paid for. So. Yeah. But I mean, all the law shows that I've heard are great. So I'm still searching for other things that aren't law shows. But <laughs> one day. Help Mike out, guys. All right. Uh, uh, I listen to a strong style story. I don't know if that's the name of his podcast, but I think I guess that's the name of his podcast, too. His podcast was pretty good for New Japan stuff. I'll have to peep that one. Uh, up next. The Super S Crown, who will win this year's most shameful wrestling fan base? Please stay tuned. Welcome back to Virtual Pros, episode 17. Uh, This week's uh, main topic is the Super S Cup. Who's going to win this year's most shameful wrestling fan base? Um, I got to give credit to Mike. He's been doing an amazing job with promoting this thing, and this might be the uh, segment that has gotten the most response. So credit to you, Mike. Hey, thanks. (laughs) I mean, like... People were like trying to DM us and like get scoops on like what was happening <laughs> next and like giving us suggestions. And I was like, man, we're on to <laughs> something. So yeah, man, it, it was definitely like one of those things where, um, yeah, it worked out. Um, should we just start it off now? Uh, yeah. For, for first off, if you want to play along at home and you don't follow us on Twitter, just go to our Twitter, uh, virtual pros. It's virtual pros or is it, vir- yeah, it's virtual pros, right? Uh, for our Twitter is VRTL Pros. Okay, yes, VRTL Pros. We've posted the brackets a thousand times, so yeah. just search our media photos and you'll see the brackets if you want to play along at home. Also, the way we're doing this is it's uh, 16 
groups. And yeah. <laughs> so it's like single elimination tournament, just like uh, the J Cup or anything like that, any kind of regular tournament. Um, but since there's two of us and we we can't just do it by voting, we have to like unanimously agree what is the most shameful. Um, also, I don't know how Al's mentality of voting works, but personally... Mine is kind of a mixture of what is actually shameful to the point where what is the most embarrassing thing that you would have to tell another human being outside of these groups, but also mixed with uh, like how widespread it is. Because obviously there is some dude out there that could probably only get an erection by like sniffing Seth Rollins like sweat or something like that. But that's probably just one person. So as shameful as that is, it's not, you know, it's not the most shameful because there's tons of people out there. Um, And uh, outside of that, like as Al said, we got a lot of feedback for this and we've already probably had enough suggestions for like 10 more of these things. Yeah. And I do kind of have a sequel to this if this works out well. So if this is, if this does get good response, we hear you. This is just like the first 16 that we thought of. So don't get too upset that we didn't pick Chris Benoit de- denialers or anything like that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, one more thing. They are not uh, grouped by like seed. There's no one or number 16 yes. seed. And this was all random draw. So, uh, yeah, that's how it's going to work out. Um, also, I'm kind of on your same wavelength where uh, I think my judging is going to go where it'd be something along the lines of, which uh, group would I least tell my coworkers that I was a part of? Yes. Okay, so we'll start off with the first matchup. Uh, it's between the cultish TNA fans and fan artists. Um, to me, this is kind of a landslide. I think fan artists at least have some creativity. Um, some of them are pretty good. Whereas cultish TNA fans, I'm just like, man, you have the internet. You can find like 10 million more like... <laughs> funner hobbies than watching tna and like defending it and thinking that it's going to survive um so i think cultish tna fans wins here in a wash yeah i think uh just to explain a little cultish tna fans i don't think everybody knows what that is so it's it's basically like there is still like a cult of tna fans that think it's the best wrestling in the world and i don't know i mean i'm sure they all work at like jiffy lube or something where they don't get out a lot but like I, it's just like so mind boggling to think. And there's a, there's a Twitter TNA Mecca quotes because there's a, their big message board is called TNA Mecca. And you could just go there and read the inane shit that these people say. Uh, fan artist is pretty self explanatory, but yeah, I think, uh, I think fan artists are kind of shameful, like, cause it's a weird subject to base your art on as wrestling. But at the same time, we do a podcast on, on wrestling, so I can't talk too much shit. Yep. Uh, I what really annoys me about fan artists is when they do things like not really do any art and just put a Photoshop filter on something and call themselves an artist because that is not art. Or when they actually do a decent piece and they just put their at name super big across the piece. Like I understand you don't want people to steal your shit, but you have to figure out a happy medium because it's just gaudy. And as an artist, you should know how gaudy that is. But um so yeah i would i'm gonna go with tna fans on this but t- you're, you're still in my my rear view uh fan artists because uh it's kind of shameful at some points all right so cultish tna fan takes the win over at um next up is attendance truthers versus vi- figure videographers uh to me this should have been the finals but it, you know it's the <laughs> luck of the draw <laughs> um, we got to talk this one out, Mike. Uh, okay, for the, I get I had a lot of questions about attendance truthers because not everybody is on Twitter. But basically, there, there's two there's two I would say two tears to attendance truthers. The uh, the more casual tear are people who are obsessed with finding out the true attendance numbers of WWE events. Like for those who don't really give a shit, which is 99 percent of the population, when <laughs> WWE says rest. WrestleMania did 100,000 people. That is a lie. They're usually like 10 to 15,000 people off. Yeah. But it doesn't matter. Like, it doesn't affect any of our lives. So it's not really a thing anybody cares about. So there's people who are obsessed with finding out about that. On top of that, if that is not enough obsession for you, Dave Meltzer, the god, is the one who usually reports the, uh, the true numbers. So now there's like a subsect of people who argue with him that his numbers are wrong. And you know, I don't know where they get their sources from, just in their fucking head from their basement or whatever. But so basically, yeah, these are just people that are obsessed with finding out the true numbers to wrestling events, which is, 
I don't know how that serves your life in any positive way. And yeah, action figure videographers is another very small section of people who uh, take their dolls, their their wrestling dolls, (laughs) and either like stop motion photography wrestling matches or just like play with them with their hands like you do when you're seven years old. And um, yeah, that is some real shameful shit. But what are you going to say, Al? (laughs) <laughs> well, two things here. Um, attendance truthers, I try to kind of understand why they do this. I mean, there's a lot of uh, Dave cosplayers on Twitter that <laughs> think they're better than Dave, but they're not. And I just imagine them, like, watching these videos of, like, the FMW show at Corken Hall and counting all of the empty seats in the stands <laughs> and trying to check him about his facts, which yeah. I think might be the saddest thing. But I also think they're trying to do some kind of, like, I don't know, just trying to see how healthy... Uh, that company is when it comes to attendance. I mean, obviously, the more seats, the more successful they are. So I guess that's their angle, and uh, that's their reason as to why they care. Is they're just trying to figure out, like, you know, where's promotion in regards to success. I don't do know. Do you think? Do you think stuff? I gotta ask one of those Japanese, those English speaking people that live in Japan. But do you think this kind of obsession, like, do you think it happens in Japan? Do you think there's attendance truth there's in Japan that are Japanese? Yeah. Probably. Like, I mean, there's like two weekly dedicated magazines. Like, there are definitely way more hardcore nerds in Japan than there are here. Man, I would like to think America is the only p- people that are like this kind of shameful about wrestling. But nah. if you say so. <laughs> That's my guess, dude. Um, vi- Yeah, figure videographers. I don't know where to put the blame here. Do you put the blame on the person that's making these shows? Or do you put the blame on the watcher? Because I think... I mean, making these videos are shameful, but if someone were to take the time out of their day to watch someone else play with their toys, I think that might be the more shameful thing to do. That is true. Um, I remember one of them. I don't know if they follow us on Instagram, but I remember one of these people like liked our, our photos or videos on Instagram, and I checked their Instagram, and they had like thousands of followers, and of that was that was real sad. Oh yeah, man. And and so like, yeah, I don't I don't really know. I mean, deep down, I would like to think that. 90% of the people that do this are under 18 and hopefully under 16 and even under 14. But there is no way to prove this. Sure. But so it's this, this, this again, like Al said, this could be the finals easily, but it's really tough because attendance truthers are definitely grown adults that should have better hobbies. And, uh, the, the action figure people are hopefully kids. So, uh, I think we're going to agree here. I think attendance truthers takes the win over uh, figure videographers. Yes, just because I am being very optimistic, even though you have sent me video proof of a grown adult doing this. <laughs> um, I'm being optimistic and saying if you're like an adult that plays with their dolls like this, you are probably kind of touched. And uh, this is mostly a child's hobby. So I'm going to assume that uh, childs do it. So, yeah, I'm going to agree with attendance truthers. Hey, man, I'm not one to judge. I mean, collect all the toys you want as a grown adult. I mean, you work hard for your money or whatever. Spend it however you like. But if you're going to film yourself uh, playing with your toys, you're a little weird. But you're not as yes. weird as attendance truthers. Yes. Uh, up next uh, is old school graphs lovers versus autograph hounds. This might be a coin flip here for me. Um, old school graphs lovers, I would think you would agree they would be someone that just kind of is in love with old Memphis wrestling and will not watch anything else. The territories, as they call them. The territories, as they call them in the biz. Uh, versus autograph hounds. Uh, these are people who camp out at airports waiting for Dana Brooke to get off their flight because they're just monitoring, monitoring it on the internet for whatever reason. Mm-hmm. Um, this is not a coin flip for me, by the way. This is a full thousand million percent uh, airport stalkers, a.k.a. autograph and photograph hounds. I think these people should be arrested. I think they should be banned from airports. They should not. They should seriously all be on house arrest. If you get caught doing this, you'd like. I don't care who it is, wrestlers, celebrities, whatever you do this with. This is this is actual stalking, and uh, it is fucking super shameful. And you shouldn't be doing this. I can't imagine explaining somebody this to like another human being and them not think, thinking you're a maniac. Quick side story uh, that <laughs> I guess relates to this in my brain, but probably not in real life. But uh, I went out on an OK Cupid date once with this girl. And uh, she was really boring. And like, I was like, this sucks. And, and like, out of the blue, she was like, oh, this is like what I do with my time. And she like showed me her phone is all pictures of people's feet. And she was like, oh, shit. Uh, like, she's like, when I'm on like the bus in the subway, I just take pictures of people's feet. 
And I was like, you do this without their permission? And she was like, yeah. And I was like, you're a fucking maniac. And she was <laughs> like, I'm not a maniac. Like, my friends say it's fine. And I'm like, your friends are fucking maniacs then. And that was the end of the date. But, like, uh, any kind of, like, photography like this is just, it is not cool, man. Like, you can't do shit like this. And uh, actually camping out at an airport to wait to meet Biggie or anybody is just, like, I don't know. They are doing God's work by putting up with this. I would deck anybody that did this if I was a fucking wrestler. So uh, autograph hounds, airport stalkers, all the way a number one for me. Possibly my finalist. So I'm just going to go out right there. Oh, uh, well, you might have talked me into uh, agreeing with you here. Um, and I, I, I should just say, for, as far as the old school graps lovers, I kind of fought for this this group because I just wanted to make fun of Bix because uh, Bix does, I think, 17 podcasts dedicated to the territories. <laughs> and um, I listened to one today called Su- So Five Supercast. Uh, Bix has the voice of a eunuch, by the way. He just sounds, he just sounds very asexual. <laughs> I mean, maybe he is. Maybe he is a eunuch. Maybe that's how he, you can concentrate so hard on wrestling is because you don't have reproductive organs. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> I mean, like, like, I don't know. The thing with autograph hounds is like maybe they're trying to make some money off of these like signatures. Whereas, like, being Jim Cornette this year is really weird, but all right, I'll go with Autograph yeah, Hounds when I don't here. think there, I, well, okay, I would say there are some that are trying to make money off of it, which is, again, super disgusting, but I think there's some that just do it for the thrill of it. And that oh, is, sure. the, that is the definition of stalking. So, like, yeah, definitely. Yeah. So, uh, okay, Autograph Hounds it is. Um, next up is Squared Circle Redditors versus Amateur Photographers. Um, I do check Reddit from time to time just to see what the trends are in the world of internet wrestling communities. Um, sometimes they post like really cool stuff, and some most of the times they Uh-oh. don't. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, full disclosure: our first episode has like 400 plays because of Reddit. Um, amateur photographers is really creepy, and I think. Yeah, am- Amateur photographers is something that I didn't know even existed until that uh, Taylor gave us that story about his fucking friend's friend quitting his job to to photograph Shimmer on the road. Well, isn't that how like guys like Dave Meltzer and like Bill After got their start by and uh, Paul Heyman and Paul Heyman? I mean, I'm guessing a lot of these people read these biographies and were like, hey, Paul Heyman became who he was through taking pictures of wrestlers. Maybe I can do the same thing. Yes. Um, also, t- t- before you decide, because I'm, I'm waiting for your decision, but yeah. a lot of people who wrote in about this and gave us their brackets and their choices, a lot of them had Reddit going like to the finals. Yes. And I don't know why. Like I said a million times on the show, I don't understand Reddit, just not even just wrestling, like anything on Reddit. I don't understand it. Sometimes I used to have to use it for work. But outside of that, like, I mean, I get the like I get the gimmick to it, but it's just like I don't understand why people use it. So so but from from what you told me, it's just people it's you made it sound like it's kind of like the worst version of the Death Valley driver message board. Like if you just took out Oh it is. All, yeah, like if you just took out all of the eclectic nerds and you just left like all the basic people. That's that's to me what I imagine wrestling Reddit is like. Oh yeah, it's just a lot of people are like, Hey, guess what Finn Balor said on Twitter and it'll, it'll be like a link <laughs> to a post. And yeah. that'll be like front page news, I guess, on there. Um, I'm going to go with Squared Circle Reddit just because I kind of think it's like breeded this fan where they think that it's cool to be like a smart and it's definitely not. So I'll go Reddit. Yeah, I mean, overall, I do think it would be more shameful to tell anybody that I'm like, you know, actually, no, because people respect photographers. So maybe yeah. there is a way you can just be like, yeah, you know, in my spare time, I go to women's wrestling and take pictures of them. Maybe that sounds good. I don't. I don't know. <laughs> um, so I guess I'll, I'll just agree with Reddit since that was like the big sentiment from our listeners, yeah. and I don't quite understand it. And you're right; it seems to like I, I imagine all of the people I hate the most on wrestling Twitter are probably people that are also on Reddit. So I'm gonna I'm gonna agree with you and go with Reddit. Good job, Reddit. Uh, next up is fanfic authors versus used clothes buyers. Um, this one is a wash for me. I'm gonna go with used clothes buyers. Just because uh, I joined this group on Facebook that deals with uh, selling vintage wrestling memorabilia, just because I'm trying to gauge the market right now on uh, what people will buy. And yeah. someone was selling a heavily used Bobby Eaton pair of trunks from <laughs> the 80s, and, uh, and they were selling it for like $250. And I think it got a fair amount of responses. And 
for you to want someone's draws uh, 30 years later is really, really, really weird. So uh, <laughs> I'm going to go with used clothes buyers for sure. I mean, fanfic uh, authors, I mean, if you're good, I mean, that requires some creativity, some tact, some skill. Uh, whereas buying used Bobby Eaton, uh, Bobby Eaton trunks requires zero skill. So, uh, yeah, this wins. Yeah, as far as like the worst you can do is fan fiction is slash fiction, slash fiction where you have like Randy Orton have sex with Stone Cold and stuff like that. Yeah. And I honestly like because that's mostly women who do that. And I don't know if other women find that shameful or they're just like, you know, we like to masturbate to this. So I don't really know how shameful it is on a woman's scale, but it's very shameful to me. Uh, but on the other hand, used clothes, like used gear buyers are, uh, they're, they also think they should be arrested. Um, <laughs> I mean, like, you know, uh, Daniel, who listens to the show, mentioned, like, yeah, he would like to own, like, one of Jimmy Hart's old ring jackets. And I would, too. Those are fucking amazing. But there is a, when we check Totacon, uh, there is a woman, I don't even know what the fuck she wrestles for. Her name is Felina. Oh, she, yeah. She, I think she puts up a new pair of underwear like every day on there and they sell out before I can even check it, which is like 12 hours later. And uh, so, so yeah, like that is just like where the fact that there's men out there that just like have hundreds of dollars waiting for this girl to drop her drawers onto a, a message board is fucking super creepy. So yeah. so yeah, hands down, use clothing buyers for me too. Up next, Joshi fans versus Twitter role players. Um, I can't shit on myself too hard because I am a Joshi fan, but I can totally admit that it's a little weird. Um, help me understand this, Mike, because you are kind of a king of the internet. All right. You're role playing as Dean Ambrose and you meet a page role player. Like eventually <laughs> this turns into like, Hey, my name is Al. Like, <laughs> is this when the transaction stops? Like, can you still bone down? Like, can you still cyber <laughs> after outing yourself as not Dean Ambrose? Like, <laughs> what do you think this like begins and ends? Um, I, you know, I have uh, experience with seeing people do this for animes, even though I don't understand it because I don't understand anime. But I've seen like anime role play accounts, and I've seen like even horror role play accounts. Yeah. I've seen some wrestling accounts, but in my mind, at least with anime and wrestling, I would, I would, again, just like playing with your dolls. Like I would assume these are people under eighteen. So I don't know. Man. Um, I'm, I would like, I, I think with anime, it's definitely people young. It's definitely young people. So I'd have to assume it's the same thing because it's probably the same types of people. So I'd have to assume it's younger people. And I assume they bone down as their characters before they try and bone down as their, uh, their cyber selves. So that's what I would think. Uh, Joshi fans, all the creepy. Oh, man, kind of rough. I'll go with Twitter role players uh, for the win. Uh, I'm not going to go with that, though, Al. So you're going to you're gonna have to fight me on this because. Uh, Let's do it. Let's see. Uh, starting off, I today like I unlocked the real reason why I think this stuff is creepy. I think this week, Joshi wrestling. Yes. Okay. Uh, this is this is also I just put Joshi fans. This is women's wrestling in general, uh, non WWE women's wrestling. That's on a whole new level. That's entertainment, but Shimmer and all that stuff. Um, I listened. I'm gonna I'm gonna not name names here, but we all know who we're talking about. Uh, I listened <laughs> to. I listened to a Joshi wrestling podcast and uh, first off they, Oh, and on top outside of that, I, I tweet, I tweeted something about Kyrie Hojo and she retweeted it. And I looked at all the people who retweeted her tweet, her retweet and they, they were all fucking super duper creeps. And I figured out why these people are creeps outside of like repressing their own sexuality. It's just because they talk about these women as if they were like horses. Um, <laughs> they like, like on that podcast, they talk about, yeah, how they're going to fucking mature and grow into like better wrestlers. And it's like, you don't even talk about man wrestlers like that. You can't talk about women like that. They're not horses. They're women. And like uh, outside of that, they never say they're never like, oh, this girl's beautiful. This girl's hot. This girl's sexy, even though you shouldn't call every girl hot or sexy because that's also kind of sleazy. But they always use words like adorable. And you don't call like a grown woman adorable. Unless you're just trying to be polite because she's kind of an uggo. So, like, I, like, it's just, like, it's super creepy when you can't commit to being, like, I'm sexually attracted to this woman. And uh, so, yeah, that whole thing is just, like, like, the dude I'm talking about in this podcast, like, this is his life, is, like, Joshi Wrestling. So, if you can't commit and just be, like, I like watching this because after I watch it, I masturbate to it. Um, 
that is there there's something like broken in your head. So uh I don't think there's anything wrong with the actual wrestling, but the actual fans. I, oh, and the other thing is like the the one shimmer match I watched, like they it was like the announcing was like if it was like a figure skating tournament. And I don't know, man. Just everything around it just has this very creepy, creepy sheen to it. And uh I do not like it. I, I you saw that documentary, you're the one who put it on the mixtape. There is there's a lot bad going on in the scene and um uh Twitter role play is is not affecting anybody. So so I don't know. I think it would be really hard for the person that I'm kind of singling out in this to uh talk to a regular human being and be like, This is my life. So 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 I don't know. Okay. Uh <laughs> which one would you tell your coworkers that you are a part of first? Joshi fan? Or I role play as Dolph Ziggler, and I have a partner online on Twitter uh, who role plays as Natalia, and we say really uh, bedroom things to each other, <laughs> pretending that we are such and such character. But it's such a small subsection of people that do that. And again, I don't know, all, dude. I think they're, they're both pretty small. They're uh, no, they are definitely not, uh, and they're all underage. <laughs> all the role players are underage, as opposed to when you're watching Japanese women's wrestling where the women are underage and they're humans and not just role playing okay. role playing as a whole is super fucking dorky. Yeah. Uh, no, no matter on what level, um, magic cards is probably the least dorky and that's still dorky. So, okay. I will go with Joshi fans. If only because, um, I still don't know what the cookie monster man's voice or face looks like. <laughs> and, uh, so in the mixtape, I think I heard his voice and that was three yeah. years ago. Yes, yes. So, uh, all right. He's Joshi down fans, for life. He is D4L. Joshi fans. That dude has at least one pair of Felina's drawers. That's for sure. He's the one that bought Makoto's entire outfit for two grand. <laughs> like, I'm sure of it. Uh, up next, merch freaks versus star rating nerds. Um, I'm looking around my apartment right now and I see a Super J Cup poster and uh, an assortment of white pro restees. Um, definitely very shameful, but, uh, I don't know. I'm just a collector by habit. Star rating nerds, uh, the way that some people are super impassioned about how Dave rates his <laughs> matches with his own rubric that he fucking like popularized. I think that's super shameful. Um, I think having cool t-shirts is like not that shameful. So I'm going to go with star rating nerds here. Yeah. Again, when I think merch freaks in this category, I just try and think of the most shameful avenue of that. And it makes me think of like when I went to Raw before WrestleMania. Uh, seeing these people just dropping hundreds of dollars on shit and it's just like it's it's insane to me that they even have this money to drop on that stuff and it's like i went to that wrestling universe place and the scope of wwe toys is just like it was way beyond me like i had no idea they made this many dolls and these dolls aren't aimed towards kids they're aimed aimed towards adults and there are adults that own all of these yep but yeah when it comes down to it um, even though it's probably a very big shock to walk into a guy's house that has more than, I don't know, 10 wrestling dolls. Um, but when you like have whole walls of wrestling dolls, again, I think if you're an adult and you do this, you, you've probably, hopefully, if you do this, you've probably either settled that you're going to be alone for the rest of your life or you already have a wife. Yeah. Um, uh, star ratings nerds is just something I, I learned a lot by doing this podcast. One is that people still care about what the fuck Dave Meltzer says about like ratings for matches. Um, and then they give this, the matches the same style ratings. And this is obviously like a rating system made by a person with like Asperger's because it's like it has quarter star points. I don't know the math on how many separate points that would equal. So it's five. So it's like 20 points. It's like a 20 point scale, correct? 25? Yeah. Uh, wait, four, eight, four, 20. Yeah, it's like a 20 point scale. Who fucking grades anything on a 20 point scale? Like if you hate it so much and you think his ratings are stupid. Use just be like it was good, it was bad, it was in the middle, or use a, like a regular five star scale, or even a, like a ratings of ten. First off, like I said this before, if you're not getting paid to judge something on a rating scale, don't do it because no one cares about your opinion about your ratings because like your ratings mean nothing because no one knows who you are. So just don't do it. Just say it was good or it was bad. That's that's all you need to say. So uh, the people who get uppity about it and the people that do them that themselves are both shameful. Just use your own rating system. This dude made this up. He gets paid to do it. Leave him alone. So, yeah, star ratings nerd easily for me. 
Uh, the last match of the uh, first uh, round is between podcasters and belt collectors. Um, with podcasters, I still haven't told anyone outside of my friends <laughs> that I do this. And um, only one person I work with knows that I do this, and they are, like, sworn to secrecy. Like, if they tell anyone that I work with that I do this, <laughs> um, I might put a hit on them. Um, belt collectors... Also very shameful. These things cost like five hundred dollars, and uh, you're not flexing for anyone when you go out to WrestleMania 32 with your NWA belt, except for other weird people. Um, the thing about belt collectors is that they're not ashamed. They actually think they're flexing very hard. Um, I might go podcasters here. Okay, well, podcasting is obviously the coolest thing ever because we do it. So. I'm not going to go with podcasting. I will say I have a way of spinning everything where no matter the dorkiest things I do, I could spin it usually or I could be like, yeah, it's okay. I do this. And people are usually convinced the wrestling thing. There are a few girls I know that know about it. Um, obviously like I'm more public with this stuff. So more be my life, but it's still like to think about it to the fear of like going on a blind date right now and being like, yeah, I do a podcast and uh, it's about wrestling. Like yeah. that was just like, it would be, it would be damn shaming. But, um, but I don't think so much when I think of this category, I don't think so much of our podcast. I just think of other people's wrestling podcasts, which are just horrible and are just like, yeah, these are my views on raw this week. How many people can do a raw recap podcast? If you're listening to this and you're thinking about starting a podcast recapping raw, don't do it because there's already 10,000 that do it and like 9,999 of them suck. So don't do it. Um, I don't understand what kind of egotism you have to think that your opinion matters about raw when everybody else does it. But, uh, on, but outside of that belt collectors is like a sentimental favorite of mine when it comes to shamefulness, because I am pretty sure this was the first thing I found out about that was like a super shameful re- hobby within wrestling. Cause I think it was on Death Valley Driver and um, somebody was just talking about it or like they wrote an article about it and it was just like they knew the guy, the name of it. So I don't. Okay, just to clarify, when I think belt collectors, I don't think of the people that are at WWE with their stupid belts like that's kind of dumb. But I think about the people that have like, you know, the NWA North American title and the fucking UWF TV title and stuff like that. And they have this one dude who specializes in this making this. And they have like tons of them. So, I mean, if you feel that strongly about podcasters, I'll, I'll, I'll agree with you. But, uh, I think there, there's a lot of levels to this belt collecting thing. Uh, I just kind of remembered how cool I was and how cool this podcast is. So I'm going to switch my vote <laughs> and go with belt collectors because I definitely remember a picture of this man and he was like Ultimo dragoning all of his belts in his like his living room. And I was like, man, what a sad life. So I'll go with belt collecting. Yeah, Uh, I mean, (laughs) again, it's like it might be a personal thing, but like I think you're better off spending that money on dolls, honestly. Like I just like the whole collecting belts thing is just mind boggling to me. It's I don't do people collect like Vince Lombardi trophies. Is there there more than one? They collect Stanley Cups. Like, I don't know. It's just it's a very weird relic and artifact to, unless they're real like if you get like rick flair's real ass belt that's pretty fucking cool but um yeah if you're just having some other dude like replica some weird territorial belt from the 70s that's just super odd man um before we leave this uh matchup if you personally make belts and you can make me the world of star uh, the world of stardom red <laughs> belt email us virtualpro 64 at gmail.com uh mike you always want to lead off the next round Okay, so this is the quarterfinals. Yes, quarterfinals is TNA fans, the TNA cultish fans versus attendance truthers. This will go much quicker since we explained everything. Yeah, I'm gonna go with attendance truth, truth truthers on this, even though maybe TNA fans are a slightly bigger fan base at this point. But um, to for the most to the common person, you know, if you explained, yeah, I watch wrestling, I watch TNA, they don't know what the fuck TNA means, so they're like, okay, cool, you're a dork, like you're you're no bigger of a, or smaller of a dork than a person that watches WWE. Trying to explain to someone that you care deeply about how many people are at these wrestling events is a whole other story. So I'm gonna go with attendance truthers. Same wave, truthers, you win. Okay, next up is the airport stalkers versus a uh, squared circle Reddit. Um. Again, I can't I can't vote against the, the airport stalkers because, like I said, I think these people are reprehensible and they need to be locked up. 
Uh, Reddit drops some dimes sometimes, and autograph hounds never do. Um, there's this one guy I think I've seen on Instagram, and he has pictures of everybody, and he looks exactly like what you're imagining in your head. Yes. Um, I'll go with autograph hounds as well. Okay. Uh, next up is used gear buyers versus Joshi fans. Um, in order to buy the used gear, you have to become a Joshi fan. So. Yeah. <laughs> It's uh, I'm going to have to go with the used gear on this because you can just be you can be me. You can be a cool guy who subscribes to stardom or you could be buying Kyrie Hojo's underwear. And that is uh, that is way worse. So I'm going to go with used gear buyers. Yeah, you can't have one without the other here. Mm-hmm. Um, use clothes, bu- use clothes buyers for me, too. Uh, so the star ratings nerds versus belt collector uh, belt collectors is the last thing. And. Al kind of made me think belt collecting is cool now, so I don't know. Um, Do not there's... let me be an influencer on belt collecting. <laughs> like, I don't want that on my LinkedIn. Like, uh, Mike and I are wrestling influencers, but I do not co-sign spending 400 bucks, bucks on a belt. But, yeah, as much as I think that, like I said, I personally think the whole belt collecting world is just, like, mind-boggling to me. Anytime somebody posts a star rating on Twitter, I cringe. Like, I cringe so deeply and I press super hard on my phone, like, to get rid of it. Just like, what are you doing, dude? Like, this is so weird. You shouldn't do this. So, I'm going to have to go with star ratings, nerds. Yeah, the tone of those tweets are unbelievable. They're like, yeah, all right, Kyle O'Reilly can shoot about three and three fourths. Whoever says it's five is a fucking asshole. I'm yeah. like, come on, man. Are you kidding me? Yes, it's just like a weird thing to be hung up on. All right, uh, semifinals. We have attendance truthers. Well, I you have the brackets in front of you. Do yeah, you yeah. Just it's, doing atten- the it's attendance truthers versus the autograph hounds, um, airport stalkers. Again, I'm going to go with airport stalkers just because uh, that is a real life thing that you have to explain to people. Attendance true thing is a thing maybe you could write off is just a part of being an average wrestling fan. But if you go to somebody's house and they have a thousand pictures with disgruntled wrestlers hanging up in their their uh, their their living room, they look like a stalker. So I'm gonna have to go with uh, the autograph hounds. I, I'm gonna fight you on this one. I think being okay. an attendance truther is way worse because these people are actually uh, mentioning Dave in their dumb tweets about how he's wrong about his reporting that he's been doing for 40 years. And uh, you have to be some kind of guy to call out Dave about his reporting. And whereas, I mean, autograph hounds, although shameful, I, feel like you have I mean, they a, are... I feel like you have a shameful secret that you waited for somebody in the airport before. And that's why you're protecting these fucking scumbags. Okay, uh, let's do this. I know you met that one guy in the airport, but that was by happenstance. Wait, what one guy? Uh, a Japanese wrestler, I can't remember. Oh, okay. That might be even creepier of me. Because uh, actually, <laughs> uh, I was at Narita Airport, and I look over, and Yoshihiro Takayama sits next to me. <laughs> and uh, I sneak a pic of him. And like three months later, I tweet at him, like, here's Yoshihiro Takayama. And he writes in Japanese, stalker. <laughs> There you go. That's why you're protecting them, because you're one of them. I didn't hunt him down, dude. I didn't look at his fucking flight information. I just thought it was funny that I have a picture of him on his phone looking at Facebook. And I was like, hey, it's you, even though you don't know I took this picture. <laughs> I think that's completely different, uh, but also kind of funny. Um, you really think, like, people that wait at the airport, that is pretty shameful. It's shameful. I think they all could, like, fall off a cliff and we wouldn't miss them. Like, I think they're all, like, touched people that have nothing else going on in their lives and they completely they don't have like the mentality to understand how wrong this is like i don't think it's i honestly don't think it's people like i don't think it's you know people like of sane mind and body doing this but it's still people doing it and it's very wrong okay i think you might have talked me into it because i mean it takes probably more time to drive to the airport and attract flight information for people than it yes. is to uh, count how many seats are not full at Corican Hall. So, yes. uh, autograph would, pounds? Yeah. I and think they're going to the finals, man. They are. And I would just say, as shameful as attendance truthers are, there are probably, I mean, you've probably even done one. There are probably like regular people we know that we are friends with, that we think highly of, that have done mock drafts in their life. And that is just as bad. 
I don't know about that. Um, <laughs> yeah, because you've probably done a couple. So. A mock draft? You never did a mock draft, man? The fuck? Oh, dude, I, don't, I haven't cared that much about sports since I was 14 years old. You so. should do like a, a baseball draft live, like in a, <laughs> that movie with um, Seth Rogen. It's a fun time. <laughs> okay. Uh, finally, is uh, used clothing buyers versus star ratings nerds. I'm going to have to go hard on the used clothes, clothes buyers on this. Um, again, you can cover up star ratings because that lives on your computer or inside of your phone. If you walk into somebody's house and see a pair of women's wrestling tights and they are a man, that is like cause for alarm where you need to run away as fast as possible because they are probably going to put you in those pants at some point and uh, lock you in a closet. So I'm going to go with the used gear buyers. Yeah, no fight for me here. I think used clothes buyers wins here just because that requires a financial commitment. And those things aren't cheap. And no, you're dude. spending like 600 bucks to get your rock off. Yeah. <laughs> and I mean, the way that you're using those, uh, those things, I really don't want to know. It's probably the most shameful way to fucking get your rocks off. At least one um, of them. For any of you midnight chokers out there, I saw my <laughs> Iwatani's dirty pants on there today. So if you want to. Get those. Not sold out yet, so get on those. Oh, God. The finals of the 2016 Super S Crown is between Autograph Hounds and Used Clothes Buyers. Mike, who do you have winning? I am going to, even though I've been pumping these, these fucking stalkers super hard, buying used clothes um, and doing God knows what with them is just, that is haunting to me. Um, again, like I said about these Autograph people, even though what they're doing it should be illegal, again, they're probably all kind of mental midgets and they don't really understand what they're doing is a horrible, horrible thing. And uh, you know exactly what you're doing when you buy, spend, when you drop a thousand dollars on a, a, a woman's pants <laughs> or even a man's pants. We didn't decide that. What do you think is worse? <laughs> do you think buying a woman's clothes is worse or a man's clothes? Worse is I mentioned, I mentioned, I saw a YouTube video of this dude. I don't think this is right, but I saw a dude who had like tons of Sabu gear. No, like I multiple. saw that same video. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And you know, deep down, like if I had the chance to put on Sabu's pants, I'd be like, I got to do this. But that's like a very small exception. But I still don't like. It's still tough to know what's worse, man or man or woman, though. Men, dude. Like, I mean, I guess it depends on what you're into. But I mean, are you asking whether or not I'd rather have? Makoto's used uh, ring wear or Bobby Eaton's. I'm taking Makoto's <laughs> 10 out of 10 times if I That's had That's tougher to choice. explain, though, I think. I mean, to who? I mean, it's both bad. <laughs> yeah, I guess. This is, this is an age-old question. Listeners out there, what do you think is worse, buying a used man's clothes or used woman's clothes? But yeah, overall, I'm going to go with used clothes buyers for the win for the S-Crown. For the S crown, you win Toticon use panties buyers. Um, you are the most shameful in 2016. Uh, we hope that you can consensually touch a woman in your lifetime without <laughs> just, you know, smelling them and thinking that that's a way, uh, to, I don't know, companionship. Yes. But, uh, virtual pros, we're rooting for you, man. Just uh, figure it out. Yes. Stop dropping your seed on used women's wrestlers clothes. Yeah, if you're dressing up as Io Shirai to jerk it, like, <laughs> man, that's a hassle. She has a lot of things to that outfit. Yeah, man. Up next, VRTL mixtape, uh, we have Super Delphin. No. Nope. Super Niwa, the other Japanese guy in a weird mask. And uh, Joshi and all kinds of other uh, cool matches. Please stay tuned. So, 
Okay, we are back here with the final segment of the night. This is the world famous Virtual Pros mixtape. We put a bunch of matches for each episode on the YouTube onto our YouTube channel at Virtual Pros. You can just search Virtual Pros on YouTube and it'll pop up with our uh, little playlist. There's a ton of matches in there. If you missed anything, it's all up there except if it got deleted. But uh, it's all worth your time for the most part. Uh, so my first match of the night is old Negro Casas versus El Hijo del Santo. This is a mask versus hair match, or as, as they call it, a, uh, fuck, I already forgot the Spanish for it. <laughs> Forget it. Something caballero. Yeah. I forgot the mask word already, but mascara. Mascara versus caballero. There you go. Uh, this is in September 1997. A uh, few weeks, a couple, two, three months ago even, I think it was listener Eric that was like, hey, you guys should have more weird lucha on your uh, playlist. Hey, congrats, like, Eric. Congratulate, my man. We support uh, higher education on the BRTL mix site. You did it, man. You did you, it, you man. Did it. Make money. Um, so I was like, okay, I'm up to that. And I had like this match from uh, from my past in mind, and then I kind of started watching it. And I was like, maybe this doesn't hold up. Maybe let me find something else. And then everything else I found, like I couldn't think of the other wrestler involved in it that I was thinking of. So I was just like, couldn't find anything. I was getting frustrated. So I was like, fuck this. I'm just going to see what some idiot says on the internet. And I was like looking over like best Lucha matches lists. And this is like unequivocally one of the most favorite Lucha matches of all time. Huh. And uh, yeah, it's not too good. Like, <laughs> I'm just going to straight up say it. Like, I don't like I get it. Lucha is not like every other wrestling. Um, even like Lucha influenced Japanese wrestling is not Lucha. And uh, they have like they play by their own rules down there. I don't really like their rules, and um, I like I like the old school bloody lucha brawls. I like when they have like monsters fight, and I like like the super flippy stuff. This stuff, this like uh, this like feud killer matches where it's not bloody and super brawly. It's just it's just like I don't I get it. I just don't like it. But um, so yeah, this is from 1997. Negro Casas is already 37 years old here. I, I'm pretty sure he is still a very active wrestler at 57 years old now. And, uh, good for him. So this was after the J-Cup where uh, I'm pretty sure he's the first match on it. We were just like, who the fuck is this guy? I don't want to see guys in masks do flips. I don't want to see this old Spanish man with a jerry curl. And uh, here he is fighting Santo. This is from a VHS tape. I would give this a VG quality if I was trading this. Oh, you're a but scammer. This is a G at least. They're like, There's <laughs> one part of this video that just pauses because it's such bad quality. I think... You are just looking at this with rose, or not rose, or you are looking at this with whatever the opposite of rose colors glasses is, because I don't think you remember how shitty VHS tapes looked. This I is recorded a on T180 <laughs> SP mode. I was a great trader, man, and you would grade this VG. Like, I would leave you the worst feedback on AOL if you fucking sent me this tape. Listeners, go watch this video. Tell us how you, <laughs> how you would grade this. VG all the way. Oh, man. Um, uh, I, this match is about a half an hour long Yeah, and you know, it's just like, I get it. This, it's like a feud killing match and it's supposed to be like real, like this is a real match. These guys are really wrestling. So it's kind of boring because real, like if you were to have a realistic wrestling match, it would be boring. And it's a lot of that. It's a lot of like rolling on the ground, punching each other. And, uh, I decided this would be like, if this match was an hour longer, this would be the greatest match ever to nap through. This match is like a baseball game to me where like you could just like take a snooze for a few minutes and look up and be like, oh, yeah, Negro Casas is winning now. Look at that. And then go back to bed. And it's kind of it's kind of uh, what's going on here. Um, What the fuck? Oh, yeah. Uh, so as I was saying, this is a match that on the Internet, at least, is just revered as one of the better Lucha matches of all time. And um I just think it's one of those things where it's like an old movie where people are like, oh, some old black and white movie from when um, there are still white and colored water fountains is like the greatest movie. And that's not true. Like they just say that because it's from like a critical stand or like an educational standpoint. It might be a great movie because they might have just like invented a new a new shot or some new film or something. And I feel like that's this match where it's just like I understand what's going on in this match. It is not the best match. It's not even. It's definitely not even the best match in 1997. So, so, so what you're saying know. is this is like the Mexican version of 6394. That's what you're saying to me right now. 
I mean, I don't believe that, but I I can see how people say that because I could I can understand what people like about this match, but it's not anything I think we need to like basically. Because uh, like I said, it's just like it's a very realistic match. Like as far as because there's not I don't even think they attempt a pin for like the first twenty minutes, and that is like a very realistic thing. And you know, there's just like a lot of realism going on in this match. Not not great. I'd rather I would rather the realism of all Japan than the realism of uh a AAA or whatever this is at this point. Um and the biggest the biggest fucking cock tease of this obviously Negro Casas loses. Everybody knows Santo still has his mask. But uh they they cut off the haircut part in the fucking video. Yep. So so I would grade it a P for that poor for cutting off the haircut. But yeah, overall I was very let down by this. If you listeners out there know of actual good lucha for us to watch, I'd be more than glad to talk about it because I'm always looking for it. I know I've seen it before. I just, you know, I just, I, I need, I need a refresher. I have too much wrestling in my brain, and I can't keep obscure lucha libre in, in it. Um. Okay. Some of my notes were uh, this match reminds me of a time in seventh grade where I was chatting up this like very cute Mexican chick, and uh, I asked her if she knew who Mil Mascaris was because the w- WWF told me that she was like that he was super famous, and uh, she had no idea. And I <laughs> think uh, that might be the reason why I never talk about being a wrestling fan in real life. <laughs> um, I wonder if ne- Negro Casas is a huge Ricky Choshu fan because he looks exactly like him. Uh, and I think like watching this match in a vacuum is probably doing this match a disservice because like they are beating the fuck out of each other. So I give him some yeah. credit for that. And I kind of wish I had some context uh, with this match, seeing as it was like probably the conclusion of their feud. Yeah, I mean it's a conclusion of like a years long feud, basically. Uh, I mean, yeah, like Mike, I was definitely dozing off. Not my favorite thing to watch. And uh, yeah, if you have any Lucha recommendations, I'm down to watch. But if it's like this, I'm not going to watch it. Um, The next match we cover is Grand Aniwa, Grand Hamada, Great Sasuke versus Men's Teo, Takamichinoku, and Dick Togo from ECW 4797. Um, as I've I just realized, because I copy and pasted the YouTube, the YouTube lists uh, Masato Yakashiji, my most hated Michinoku pro wrestler, and uh, he was not on this match, so thankfully. Yeah, I think uh, he took Naniwa's place because Naniwa got injured. I'm not sure if it was this match, but yeah, he got hurt. Yeah. That's what happened. Um, as I've said before on previous episodes, I'm a huge fan of the Better Than Eagle six-man tag, and uh, this was the precursor to this. Um, some kid in the front row with like a Jonathan Taylor Thomas haircut tries to start an Enoke Bombay chant, which is low-key racist. I didn't like that one bit. <laughs> um, all right, I had a question for you, Mike. So Men's Teo's gimmick is like, he's just really cosplaying an American wrestler, right? He has like yes. the he Lex Express Terry tights. Funk. He loves Terry Funk. He does the Hulk Hogan big boot. Um, do you think we're like ready for an NXT gimmick that involves like a white man having the gimmick of a tape trader? Like, he, like, dresses, like, uh, I don't know, Great Muda, and he does, like, giant Baba mannerisms, and, like, steals, like, I don't know, Kabashi's moveset? Like, do you think we're ready for that gimmick? I've thought of that. I've honestly thought of that gimmick for years, since, like, back in the day. Like Tape, tape trader gimmick? Not tape trader so much, but just, like, super Mark fan gimmick. And I guess they kind of did that with Eugene, but he was also retarded, which, I mean, it adds up. But, like, yeah, I, th- I think we're ready for that gimmick, honestly. I think it would work. I mean, I don't know. I don't think you could call him a tape trader, but basically like an otaku version of a wrestling fan. Yes. Yeah. NXT. Uh, Paul, if you're listening, uh, yeah, Paul. let us write your show. We got some ideas. Yes, um, we got he, some booking. We got some ideas for creative. We did. <laughs> hey, for the Ryan, go home show. Ryan Ward, the lead writer for SmackDown. Uh, I got some tips for you, Doug. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I mean, everyone working uh, in this match is just working like a million miles an hour. I mean, tail almost kills Naniwa. With his back suplex. Um, the Taka versus Sasuke section is, you know, always really good. And, uh, Sasuke clipping his knee on the, like, there's like a stage that's like by the ring. Like, he mm-hmm. clips his knee on the, uh, Asai Moonsault. And that is really, really bad to watch. Like, I hated watching that because I love great Sasuke and he fucks his knee up really bad. Uh, yeah, this, I, I don't, th- yeah, I've never seen this match before. Um, this is a cool venue. I don't remember the name of this, but I'm pretty sure it's in Queens. I think it's just like a weird, like VFW or something odd. Not a VFW, but some weird, like public building. Uh, I always forget the name of it though. Uh, it's basically like a mini Hammerstein ball- ballroom. Yeah. Uh, it looks so trashy in 1997. It just looks like a dirty, dirty place, like real New York before they ruined it. But, um, pre Giuliani. 
pre Giuliani for sure, even though I think this was right during Giuliani. But yeah. uh, I don't know what I'm saying. One thing I noticed outside of <laughs> your racist chants that you notice is that uh, there's a lot of Japanese style chants that people are doing where they're going, Naniwa! Yeah. And, doing that. <laughs> and he claps and that off is, beat and it's so distracting. Yes, and that is, speaking of shameful, that is super shameful. I will give them credit, though. This is 1997. This is very pre-internet. Yeah. So these people are like on the finger of the pulse of being the biggest dorks in wrestling where they are replicating Japanese style chants. These we'll give were, them credit uh, for that. Quabrata, Quabrata readers back in the day. They were yeah, big yeah. Mike Lorfeis fans, probably. <laughs> yes. David Lynch traders. I think not David Lynch, whatever. George Lynch, I think, was the guy who had all the tapes. They were into uh, yeah, Mayfield Mayhem, those kinds of dudes. <laughs> yeah. Uh but yeah, they were doing like Japanese style chants, which was super lame. Um yeah, I would I would have killed to see this match in nineteen ninety seven though. They are yeah. it is not as impressive as it was back in the day, but seeing even to this day, seeing these go- dudes work so fast, you gotta kinda throw psychology out of the window with this because they're just going so fucking fast. And uh it's like, you know, it's a steady pace of fastness too. It's not like dudes doing a billion moves and then stopping for a little while to rest. These dudes just like don't fucking stop. They just have crazy cardio. Right. Um Outside of that, as Al said, Sasuke just fucking ruins his knee on this stage. And uh, I am surprised that somebody, it probably does exist. There has to be a compilation out there of a fast cut or whatever you call those things of uh, all of the dumbass things that great Sasuke has done. Dude, the there rest- was, but they took it down. <laughs> like there was like a five minute like YouTube video of him just like fucking himself up. <laughs> and, and like I'm- it's super, I think it's like set to like offspring or some shit. Like. <laughs> If you if you have this video saved, like I will PayPal you five dollars because it's amazing. There's like shit like with him like falling off like a twenty foot ladder onto the ground at Corkin <laughs> Hall. There's like a clip of him like in a barrel like doing a front flip to the outside and just landing on his head. Like it's <laughs> fucked up. I am yeah I'm bummed I I missed this. Oh it's bad. But yeah overall this is a good match. It makes me really I need to get my ass in gear. I said it like three months ago. I need to hit up like IVP video or Rudo reels and get that like 700 match compilation of Mitch Noku pro. Yeah. So I really miss watching this stuff. So I'm going to hit them up soon. Okay. My next match is real Lucha Libre. This is, this is the real shit right here. Um, <laughs> again, I, when I was checking these lists for matches, they listed this match as taking place in Mexico. It does not take place in Mexico, yeah. but I was like, it's close enough. Sure. <laughs> I'm sure Mexicans watch this match. So I guess it's officially Lucha Libre. This is uh, the Dragon Kid versus Darkness Dragon from Toriumon 2002. Uh, I don't think we've ever really spoke on Toriumon that deeply nah. on the show, but there was like a solid three months where Toriumon was my favorite thing on Earth. And because uh, it was basically like a, a continuation of Michinoku Pro. It was like Michinoku Pro with a little more pizzazz to it. And uh, the Dragon Kid was like... I guess he he was outside of Ultimo Dragon. He was like the ace of uh of Torimon because he was like like the Ultimo Dragon Junior basically. And uh, this is kind of at the tail end of Torimon before it became Dragon Gate and got uh, a little homoerotic, a little too for schoolgirls. Um, too is still visual, ones. as they would say in Japan. A lot of <laughs> visual wrestlers. A lot of visual wrestlers. Uh, this was yeah, this was like on the tail end where they're just kind of transitioning into that. But this is again. A best two out of three falls, mask versus mask match. Uh, big crowd. I don't know. What venue is this, Al? Do you know? I have no idea, but it was big enough to house like one regular ring and one like octagon uh, ring or six sided ring. So I yes. have never seen this venue ever. No one involved in this match is wrestling in anything this size anymore. That's for <laughs> sure. They, uh, they probably look back at this match fondly. But um, yeah, so Darkness Dragon is part of uh, a group at the time called M2K, which was. Uh, there's a lot of groups in Torimon, a lot of bad guy groups, not too many good guy groups. But um, you learn right away that Darkness Dragon is an asshole, and so is his crew. Because all they do is beat the shit out of Dragon Kid through this whole match. Yeah. Like, badly. They just badly, badly beat the shit out of him. And to the point where it's kind of ridiculous. Like, no one is stopping this. Somehow, uh, Darkness Dragon wins a fall by count out. But uh, Dragon Kid can't get thrown a bone and get a fucking DQ here somehow. He's getting his ass beat over and over again by all these dudes. Um, outside of that, I, I honestly don't have, have any like uh, great notes to this match. It's it's a fun match. It's like it's what I'm looking for in a Lucha Libre match. They do the flips, they do the mask tearing, they do the blood. 
They do all the elements that I like from Lucha Libre masks. They do like a super bad asshole bad guy against a super good good guy who is too good to do anything bad, basically. Even though like Dragon Kid gets a little rough here and there. Um, uh, in the end, again, you probably, if you have any recollection of these guys, you know Darkness Dragon does not win this. Uh, he is, before this, he was a wrestler named Makoto, who was in, uh, I think, the later version of Crazy Max. It's one of my favorite stables in wrestling of all time, <laughs> featuring Sima and Teru and a bunch of other fucking super pricks. Judo Sua, and, uh, right? Yeah, Judo Sua. And I'm pretty sure, yeah, I think their, their catchphrase might have also been, where Crazy Max fuck you. It was something fuck. I know that, but uh, they were they were great guys. Um, yeah, so yeah, Darkness Dragon loses his mask, and it's revealed that he is a Japanese man. No, he is uh, he is Makoto, who is kind of a vampire wrestler. He's better known now as a wrestler named K Ness, which I really have. I don't think I've ever seen a match of his as K Ness. Uh, also, I don't. <laughs> I think the beginning is cut off, but at the end, when when uh, <laughs> Dragon Kid wins. His ring music is Bonnie Tyler's I Need a Hero, which is <laughs> the fucking lamest music anybody has had in a wrestling match. Whereas almost like, oh man, like this match sucks just for that. Two stars taken off just for his Bonnie hit Tyler I Need a Hero played at the end of this fucking match, man. That is how you know Tori Mon and Dragon Gate was just going down the shitter and turning into a very visual wrestling match when they're playing like gay club anthems like I Need a Hero. <laughs> Uh, for their wrestlers, but uh, but yeah, overall it was a great match. Not the best, but it, like I said, it, it represents everything I do like about Lucha Libre. Not too many notes because I watched this match after the uh, Negro Casas uh, match, which put me to fucking sleep. So I was just yeah. dozing off. <laughs> um, I wrote down that like cars and like denim, Japan just takes something and just does it better than uh, the inventor. <laughs> uh, I like this Lucha way better. And uh, yeah. my other note was I wish Jushin Liger's character had spinoffs like this. Like, there should be a Darkness Liger, there should be a Jushin Liger 2, there should be an El Hio del Liger, etc. Like, this would be my dream. Just like an entire federation is based on Liger yeah. spinoffs. Well, as you'll, you'll know from nerds on the internet who've just learned this, but want to act like they've known it all along as they tried with Chris Jericho and it failed. Yeah, come on, guys. Yeah, we're going to get an email <laughs> typed out about that. Sorry. <laughs> um, The last match for tonight's VRTL mixtape is between Arisa Nakajima versus Io Shirai. 12 29 2013 it's the jwp openweight champion in arisa nakajima versus the world of stardom title which i want to buy if you have a, a hookup on titles vrtl pros <laughs> um my first note is uh i imagine like Ar- arisa nakajima's breathing noises must be heaven for uh, asmr fetishists <laughs> like she has a very like peculiar breathing style that i bet would just drive people crazy um i'm not too familiar with her but her groundwork to open this match is very snug like the opening <laughs> seven or eight minutes of this uh, match would definitely garner some women's wrestling chance a lot of both these this is girls. why joshi fans made it past the first round guys just listen to al talk right now <laughs> <laughs> um hey man i didn't say i wasn't a creep okay so this match picks up when a shirai just launches herself on a suicide dive and uh arisa moves and io just eats shit on the landing which is really really crazy to watch um one of the best spots I've ever seen happens on the outside when Arisa goes for a clothesline. Io ducks and crawls under the ring, and like Arisa doesn't know where Io's at. Uh, Io appears from the other side of the ring and hits this huge springboard uh, splash, which is uh, it was on her Instagram page, but like it's not showing up. I don't know why. Maybe it got flagged because I tagged Stardom in uh, Kanji. But <laughs> whatever. If you flagged this, fuck you. Um, yeah, the last half of this match that was ridiculous. Like Arisa hits these like double foot stomps on the outside. Like, one of which you can just hear, like, Io's life just leave her body. Like, you just hear, like, the air, like, <laughs> come out of her, her mouth, which is fucking crazy. Um, and Io Shirai is hitting, like, I guess what you could best describe as, like, these high angle release pedigrees, which are just, like, inches away from, like, ending Arisa walking. Um, <laughs> I want to see this match in 16. Like, I think promotion versus promotion angles are, like, my favorite. And, like, they're probably a lot better than they were three years ago. Uh, yeah, uh, just like Al, I'm not familiar with this Orisa Nakajima girl. Of course I'm not. Um, I just assume since this was three years ago, she's probably now the ripe old age of 28 and retired. But, <laughs> she's still going, uh, man. She's still going, I guess. Um, so where do I start with here? Uh, yeah, first off, I'm pretty sure this dude shows up for 
a lot of championship stardom matches. I just call him the the grandmaster pervert belt holder. Uh, I imagine this guy is the head pervert of stardom, and uh, he probably owns all of the used clothes because he wears a tiny little fedora, <laughs> and he looks like a guy who looks at a lot of schoolgirl porn that's all day. A, that's a Rossi Ogawa. There we go. Rossi Ogawa, you're the grandmaster pervert. Yeah. Um, this takes place in Carrickon Hall, and I was wondering this while watching Best of the Super Juniors last week. I don't understand how those banner signs work that they hang up. Like, oh, do you think? Are, yeah, me too. <laughs> are Japanese people just so polite where they're just like, okay, you're going to put yours here. I'm going to put mine here. Because, like, it's not so much in this one, but during the Best of Super Juniors, there's a ton of signs up there and they all perfectly fit. And there's no way, like, you know, you don't know all the people that sit in the front row. So you can't just be like, yeah, I'm going to bring a sign that day because they're all different shapes and sizes. I would like to know that. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not so concerned about how they place these signs because, I mean, Japanese people are very polite by nature. So yeah. they probably work something out. I'm more concerned with who really makes this very well-designed poster for Jay White. Oh, yeah, I know. That had to be a plant. <laughs> like, that had to be, you know, they're walking. Like, when I went to ROH, I found out the secret is that there's one guy who I assume works for ROH. Yeah. Uh, hands out the streamers. It's not a bunch of dorks bringing the streamers. There's just one guy. So I assume there's one guy with a Jay White sign. I was like, okay, you're going to go hang this up. But <laughs> yeah. I, I don't know because, yeah, there's no way. Like, who's making that Jay White sign? Exactly. Uh, there was a huge one at the Best of the Super Juniors. So I'm like, no one likes Jay White. That's ridiculous. Yes. Not, not even his family would make that. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, this match starts off pretty sexy as uh, as Al called it. He called it snug groundwork. I just call it boner material. <laughs> there's a lot, of, uh, a lot of writhing around on the ground, a lot of scissoring. This is a super sexy match in the beginning. Yep. Um, to, snug, to, dude. Snug. It's very snug. To call back to my uh, my Joshi ran earlier, Arisa does not care how adorable Io is at all because uh, she beats the adorableness right out of her. Um, I like this Arisa girl because uh, she fights like a bruiser, but she is herself adorable. So you don't you don't see that often. You see like the bruiser Joshi girls, and you're like, she's gonna fuck shit up. She's not hot at all. And the hot girls are usually more. Um, uh, graceful, you know they they do the dives and the moonsaults like yeah. Io and Ari Hojo, but, but uh, this Arisa girl is like a, a mixture of the both. So I'm super into her. Hope she uh she shows up in Stardom somehow. I don't know how that shit works, but um yeah, as as Al said, the uh they're like high angle pedigrees. It's kind of like a butterfly drop or something. I just wrote down. I don't know what this move is. Yeah, but uh. Io hits one of them and just drops Arisa like right on her face, just like fucking <laughs> yeah. face first, no hands like guarding it. Just and I was like, Pfft. and oh, I yeah. was just like, that's it, she's done, man. Like her fucking face is broken, but she gets up and just takes like a knee to the chest right afterwards. They're, they're yeah, they're really like duffing each other here. I don't know if, uh, if there's some bad blood or or what, but they're they're throwing some real ass punches at at points. And, uh, yeah, this is a, a pretty brutal match. And, spoiler alert, it has a shitty ending. Just like most, a lot of the greatest stardom matches, it seems, have uh, shitty endings. But, um, yeah, this is... This, I've, Alice showed me a lot of these brutal women's matches. I don't think this is, like... It's probably a six or seven on the brutal scale. But it's, uh, it's definitely worth watching. It's, like I said, any girl who's sexy and a bruiser is uh, a number one in my book. So, so uh, yeah, I liked it. There's a, a Risa Nakajima versus Mako Satomura match that happened last year that uh, I think I'll watch tonight after the uh, Thunder, uh, OK, or Thunder Warriors game, and I bet that match yeah. is probably a 12 out of 10 on the <laughs> fucked up scale for sure. Um, yeah, that wraps it up. That was episode 17 of the Virtual Pros podcast. Uh, please email us if you have any questions or if you have the hookup on Stardom Belts at virtualpros64 at gmail.com. Hit us on iTunes uh, with Virtual Pros, same as SoundCloud. Insta Twitter at VRTL Pros. Uh, Mike, any last words? Actually, I forgot to mention that if you are a super fan now and you want to listen to all of our episodes, we, we don't know why they're disappearing from iTunes, so they're all on SoundCloud. If you're missing the, the early episodes, just go to SoundCloud and you can find them. But uh, outside of that, thank you for supporting the product. And uh, this was our go-home show. <laughs> Episode 17. Peace.